The mission of the Bremen is to connect people to Jewish history, culture, and arts. Today, we bear witness. This is a program that is done for 13,000 school children in our absence of humanity gallery all year long. But on a day like this, we get to witness in a room together the resilience of a survivor. So thank you for joining us for this intimate afternoon, and thank you so much for the Sarah Giles Moore Foundation for making it possible. I'd now like to welcome to the stage the head of the Weinberg Center for Holocaust Education, Rabbi Joe Prass. Good afternoon. It is a great honor to welcome you here today and to introduce Mr. Murray Lynn and the film that you will see about his life. Mr. Lynn was born in the town of Bilkey, Hungary, a small town of only about 6,000 people with approximately 500 Jewish families. What happened in Hungary takes place in the context of centuries-old European anti-Semitism. This intolerance and hatred flowed throughout the history of Europe, but as Murray himself has often observed, no period was as lethal, as sweeping, and as final as the events of the 20th century. A year before World War II, in 1938, Hungary and Germany formed an alliance, with Hungary passing the same anti-Jewish laws first imposed in Germany when Hitler took power. The Jews of that region began to lose their freedoms and livelihoods. Existence became harder and harder. In Hungary, the Nazis found willing collaborators who were willing to enact the anti-Semitic programs that they fostered. Then late in the war, in March of 1944, German troops occupied Hungary, with Hitler installing a new government led by the anti-Semitic Aerocross Party. Within two months, the Jews from all the towns and villages of Hungary were rounded up and deported to death camps, nearly 440,000 people. Murray's family was sent to Auschwitz, as were all the Jewish families of Bilki. And so disappeared the entire Jewish community Murray had grown up with. But Bilki was not unique. By mid-July of 1944, except for the capital of Budapest, all of Hungary was Jew-free. The Holocaust had swallowed up within a matter of months almost one half million people, most of whom died in Auschwitz. And as you will hear, Murray was a witness to these events in Auschwitz. Again, in his own words, Auschwitz tested a thousand times the limits of human endurance and resilience in the face of program starvation and relentless savagery. Murray Lynn lived through these inhuman times as a young teenager, merely 15 years old at war's end. And yet through his own profound determination and strength of character, he has created a rich and purposeful life. Orphaned and alone at the end of the war, he attended school in Scotland and then completed the City College of New York. In 1956, he moved here to Atlanta, finding love with his dear wife, Sonia, and the joy of his three children. He also became a successful businessman, rising to the position of president and CEO of international operations for a major corporation. And what I can tell you personally is that Murray is a thoughtful, caring, eloquent, and dear soul. I know I have learned much from him, and I hope that you will learn much today, too. Today, we'll have the opportunity to watch his documentary on the life of Murray Lynn. And after viewing the film, Murray will give some remarks and then take questions from the audience. For the Q&A portion, please, you'll raise your hands, and we'll be happy to bring a microphone around to you. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the story of an amazing man, Mr. Murray Lynn. You are looking at a person who is a living testimony to the Holocaust. At age 80, Murray Lynn 
might be expected to spend his days dwelling in the satisfied bliss of many accomplishments. Instead, for our sake, he intentionally relives nightmares almost too horrible for words. I just want the audience to remember that Auschwitz was the kingdom of death, that it swallowed up the young and the old, the meek and the mighty, and the simple and the educated. And I hope that this kingdom of death that we experienced is immortalized for future generations so they will better understand why we must talk about this. For 11 years, Adolf Hitler dedicated himself and his regime to destroying all of the Jews of Europe. He nearly succeeded. But one survivor said it is not accurate to place responsibility for the Holocaust on this lone villain or even his army of Nazis. He says centuries of hate provided fertile ground for both the Third Reich and the Holocaust. What happened when Hitler came to power, uh, Hitler in a way pierced that facade of silence. A facade of silence, a hate that lay so close to the surface of European society that when given voice and power, it erupted into unimaginable barbarism. One person who, as a teenager, lost everyone and everything to that hate, believes a facade of silence still lurks, luring us again to slumber. And so he has awakened his own voice to sound the warning. As I got older, uh, when I turned 70, I came to the realization that my life is not entirely uh, my own. It belongs to uh, tragic history. And from that, we need to draw some meaning, and we need to draw some direction, and we need to draw some lessons. But most of all, we want to send a message to the world for them to remember the consequences of silence, the consequences of, uh, of, of hatred. Every survivor of the Holocaust provides a unique and personal perspective. As you will learn, Murray Lynn survived not just the camp that slaughtered one and a half million people, but a terrible trauma prior to his deportation to Auschwitz. But despite all the terror and loss he endured, Murray Lynn not only held on to his life, but also to his humanity. We all have certain attributes, and I think the greatest attribute that I have is I cannot nurture hatred. All their clothes, their shoes, they had to dump them in one place and then we were selected whether we're going to work or we're going to die. He was about the age of these visitors when he entered Auschwitz. But whether Murray Lynn's personal story or even the Holocaust itself is within the grasp of every young mind is unlikely. The survival rules were never to let the Germans know that you are sick, that you're incapable of performing the slave labor. If you are a fighter, you can overcome adversity. If you're not a fighter, you capitulate, and I was a fighter. For most of his adult life, hardly anyone was aware of Murray Lynn's past. So his global business achievements, his enduring and happy marriage, his success as a father, while admired, may not have appeared that extraordinary. If only people had known. Even today, at 80 plus years, he remains a disciplined man with a brilliant mind and a unique charm. He just never offered explanations for why he avoided trains. 
or large dogs. Given what we know about the treatment of Europe's Jews before and during World War II, it is hard to believe any survived. But in thousands of places, Jewish survival amidst vastly larger European Christian communities has historically been a profound challenge. And so it was for all the Jews in the Hungarian town of Bielki, including a young man known to friends as Maurice. We were pretty much isolated from non-Jews. Uh, the Christian community did not want to have to, to do much with us. They, they did not, we were not integrated in the community. We knew the reasons why. Uh, it goes back uh, 1800 years. Uh, the church for many, many years uh, had a, uh, 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 their, their doctrine was encapsulated in four words. Jews are unrepentant sinners. We were treated as infidels, as heretics, and they wanted very little to do with us. And this was a, a, a weekly sermon in a church that Jews killed Christ, that Jews were unrepentant sinners, and we must be treated accordingly as pariahs and isolated. Hating Jews, uh, being intolerant of Jews was part of the DNA of its culture and creed. And there is not very much we can do to change their mindset. So we lived uh, almost in fear. Uh, we did not want to argue with these people because we knew it was a no-win game. Uh, and so we accepted our fate for many, many centuries as being the underclass. Some elements of the Christian church did protest Nazi treatment of Jews and other minorities. Those efforts were brutally suppressed. More commonly, however, widespread church indifference and even support for the Nazi policies existed in many parts of Europe. So what began in the early 30s with vile propaganda evolve with shocking haste into isolation, brutalization, deportation, and the systematic slaughter of Europe's Jews. And again, while Hitler provided the face for these acts, tens of thousands willingly carried out his orders, while millions passively ignored unmistakable indications of the ongoing crimes. Hitler emboldened those people he encouraged them when they realized that they can speak freely because it came from other powers. It emboldened them to be more anti-Semitic and it encouraged them to call us names. It encouraged them to taunt us. It encouraged them to mock us. It encouraged them to hate us. So things turned from being a passive we had sort of a passive relationship to a hostile relationship. With Hitler in power, Nazi-like paramilitary groups formed or reformed across Europe. In Hungary, Arrow Cross, a murderous anti-Jewish group, had existed since the 15th century when the Nazis began to ransack Europe. Hungary allied with Germany and thousands joined Arrow Cross which in 1942 began targeting for death educated Jews like Murray's dad, Abe. That was a, a turning point in our lives. Uh, that was the beginning of the end. I remember roughly at uh, two or three in the morning, we had a knock on the door and the two Arrow Cross fascists burst into our door, into our room and a wanted uh, to see my dad. We were all asleep. And when they told us, uh, when he saw dad, they told him uh, to pack, uh, to put his clothes on and pack his bags, whatever he wants to take with him, and follow them uh, to an unknown destination. 
We were hysterical when this happened. We all wanted to know why dad was taken, where dad was being taken, and what the charges were. But we, they were unresponsive. My dad was an educator and a community leader. And what they did first is they decided to surround all educators and community leaders to get rid of them first so the community remains leaderless. Dad was whisked away into uh, the silence only to be broken by barking dogs and whining wolves. That's all I remember. Two weeks later, we heard that Dad and roughly 15 other community leaders were marched to the Carpathian Mountains and forced to dig their own mass grave. And then they were all executed. This changed our lives forever. Suddenly we became vulnerable and very insecure. My mom didn't know what to do next. She didn't know how we we're going to survive. And how did Murray's non-Jewish neighbors and classmates react to the executions? My impression is that they were glad because we were outsiders. They told us that we did not belong there in that community. We were treated as strangers. And if they took away another Jew or killed another Jew, it was, it was a, a relief to many of them because it's one Jew less left in the community. I don't believe, knowing the mindset of those people in those days, I don't believe they cared. Mari's famously lovely mother, Regina, was suddenly very vulnerable. As the oldest of four sons, Murray tried to protect her. But just 13, he was no match for the armed fascist. I've only spoken about this two or three times in 60 years because it's too painful and I have a difficult time uh, facing it. We had another knock on the door and a narrow cross fascist soldier burst into our house and demanded to go to bed with my mom. I resisted it and he took out a gun and he says, if you don't stop it, he says, you'll be dead and no one will care. My mom told me to stop it. And I did. Next thing I knew, I woke up at six or seven in the morning. He was gone. My mom was never the same. By the spring of 1944, the war had turned sharply against Germany, confident that they could safely rely on the full participation of Arrow Cross. The Nazis nevertheless went ahead with their plans to annihilate Hungary's one million Jews. Roughly April 1944, an early morning knock on the door, and uh, we were told to pack our bags and follow the Arrow Cross soldiers to the train station. Mom, I remember she pulled the sheets and blankets from our beds to put our belongings because we didn't have luggage in those days. Only the well-to-do had luggage. And we put pots and pans and bread and flour and whatever for subsistence. And I remember my mom tied all the baggage on our necks. It was a surreal scene that you only see in a movie. As we were tracking to the train station, it was an orchestrated scene on the street. So many of them are neighbors, many of them we knew because it was a small community. 
we never believed that there was so much anger and hate and contempt for us as we were trudging with our baggage on our backs. They were hurling epithets at us, spitting at us, throwing rocks at us as we were led to our doom. Nobody, but nobody came to our assistance. There was no moral outcry in the community. Murray, now 14, with every other Jew in his town, was sent to a nearby city and into a ghetto created to serve as the temporary holding area. A few days later, Murray, his mother, and three brothers were shoved into an airless cattle car. For 72 hours, the train crept toward the death camp just across Hungary's border with Poland, Auschwitz. Unfathomable. People in a cattle cars were wailing and crying and praying for salvation. We had no food and no sanitation facilities. People had to relieve themselves in their clothes. There were no no sanitation. For three days, we suffered this, human, uh, this dehumanizing experience. The cattle car smelled like a sewage plant. It was unbearable. Many older people died. The sick people died. When we got to Auschwitz, I don't remember how many people we took out of the cattle car dead. Oblivious, even of where or what Auschwitz was, most of Murray's group was designated for a same-day execution. The door jerked open, and all of a sudden, we were surrounded by the Sonderkommando, uh, which were Jewish prisoners helping us unload, and they helped the Gestapo uh, with various chores, and surrounded also by the Gestapo. And they started shouting at us in German, to put the clothes in a certain area and to line up. The Sonder Commandos came up to the train and they took off many of those who couldn't walk, uh, those who were too sick or those who were too tired. The very first thing we saw were the smoke belching chimneys and the smell of flesh. And we knew immediately that something, something is going on here but we had no idea. These are Auschwitz photos of Hungarian Jews taken in early May of 1944, the very week Murray and his entire community arrived. It seemed that even those who feared the worst tried to remain as calm as possible and to comfort the children. The young, young kids were less affected, we were more resilient than the older people. We didn't think as far, as deep as some of the older people. Mom was re very reassuring. She was a very um, positive person. I remember she would tell us, don't worry, I'm behind you, I'm with you, everything is gonna be all right, don't worry about it, we'll all make it. Well, just let's pray to the heavens. And she gave us peace and solace uh, to the very last moment. The last moment Murray would ever share with his family occurred within minutes after the family staggered down from the cattle car. We were immediately separated. My mom huddled around my three brothers. She was sent to one side and I was sent to the other side. The people, those capable of working, the younger guys uh, under 30, under 35, were separated for work for a slave labor camp, and the rest of them were assigned, and they were told that they were going to take a, um, a disinfectant bath. And I remember a Sunder commando told us, told me, tell him you are 16. I was 14, tell him you're 16. He knew something I didn't know. If I was 16, they would assign me to work. And all I remember, the only thing I remember 
My mom was hysterical when they yanked me away from her and she bid me a farewell. The last thing she said, I love you, son. I hope to see you again. And that was the last time I saw my mom and my three brothers. I was assigned a striped suit. My number was 83,000. And I asked one of the prisoners, would you by any chance know where my mom and three brothers went? And he paused for a minute or two and didn't know what to tell me, didn't know whether he should tell me or not. He asked me to come out of the barracks, says, come on out, I'll show you where they are. And for a moment, I was relieved. He takes me out of the barrack and then points to the chimney. That's where they are. This was roughly an hour after we were separated. This is how swiftly death came to these people. I said to myself, I'm alone. I have no incentive anymore to remain alive. Like most prisoners, he would regain his will to live, but will was rarely enough to overcome their captors' commitment to kill them all. Inhuman conditions were the rule, beginning with barracks in which 500 were crammed, where no more than 75 could possibly have hoped to survive. Three-tier barracks, we slept three people per bunk, so there were nine people. The, uh, the worst barrack, the worst bunk was the bottom one because they took everything from uh, all the incontinence and, and diarrhea and, and uh, everything that came from, from the top two tiers. Uh, they, uh, uh, they were the receivers of all the indignities uh, over, over the, overnight. But uh, we slept without blankets. We were given blankets. We were assigned blankets uh, initially. It was so brutally cold that we took those blankets, most of us, and tore them up and made vests out of them. And we could not show those vests because we would have been brutalized by the Germans or even murdered. We took them, those vests under our shirts. And uh, some of us uh, used paper bags from cements where we worked in factories and made uh, vests out of them to, to survive. Each morning, Murray helped to remove a dozen or more corpses from the barracks. Then the night's survivors lined up for their guards to decide who could still work and who instead would be murdered. They didn't count us. They knew that we could not escape. But the roll call, the purpose of the roll call was to cull the sick and the uh, emaciated and those who are incapable of working. And they told them they were going to the hospital. Well, the hospital was a euphemism for the gas chambers. I was picked no less than 10, 12 times to go to the hospital because I was too weak and too emaciated. And I slipped back to the line because I knew what a hospital meant. Uh, my cousin, I had a cousin with me there, his name was Sam Green, and he volunteered to go, quote, to the hospital, and I said to him, Sam, do you realize that this is not a hospital you're going to? Do you realize where you're going or what you're doing? And he said something to me again that haunts me still. And my Hungarian name was Maurice, and he says, Maurice, I know where I'm going. I will only suffer for 10 or 15 minutes, but she'll suffer until you die an undignified death from starvation. He says, who is better off, you or I? For the slaves of Auschwitz, death was usually gradual, horrible, and inevitable. Murray's body became skeletal as he carried 50-pound cement sacks for 14 hours each day. And acts of cruelty or murder could come at any minute. I'll never forget, uh, a sergeant came over to me 
when I was in uh, Auschwitz, and it's the only time I was threatened with my life. He comes over to me and he says, Junge, was habst du aufgefressen, dass du hier bist? I violated the rule of answering. I said, gar nicht. And he slapped me so hard that the thrust knocked me probably about 20 feet from him. I was blind, bloodshot and blind in one eye and deaf on my ear probably for weeks on my left side. Diseases like typhus, dysentery and cholera kill thousands. Though the biggest killer of prisoners was unrelenting starvation. Hunger assaults your mind and the body until it become delirious. It was impossible to survive on what they fed us. We were given a cup of coffee and a slice of bread in the morning, nothing at noontime, and at night a cup of foul tasting potato soup. This was roughly 150 to 180 calories a day. The difference between those who survived and those who perished had a great deal to do with a mindset. There has to be an innate gift. If you believe in God, it may be a God-given gift. Uh, but it's a gift that I had to fight for life. And I fought for life every inch of the way, every moment of the day. I knew that I wanted to live. I knew that I wanted to survive. I knew that I was the only one in my family who survived at that point. Deprivations at Auschwitz spared no one. So despite being a young teenager, Murray says he rarely got special considerations from his fellow prisoners. You will probably hear different stories from different people, but my memory and my impression was that with few exceptions, we all became animalistic. We were all fighting for survival and we became desensitized about each other. By early 1945, Russian soldiers were at the gates of Auschwitz. Lacking time to kill and dispose of their bodies, the Nazis elected to march thousands of prisoners, including Murray Lynn, hundreds of miles to camps in Germany. Over the course of 10 brutal cold days, Murray fought to put one foot in front of another as the hateful Nazis committed murder all around him. When I remember when we were marching on the death march, when uh, the they guards clobbered the sick people to death because they didn't want to waste a bullet on them. We knew that if we could just survive this terrible ordeal, that ultimately we would be liberated, but we didn't know how long it's going to take. We heard the planes flying above us. We knew that it's close, but we didn't know if we can survive long enough to see the daylight. It was an abyss of the worst kind. Uh, when I was liberated, uh, I weighed roughly 60, 62 pounds, something like that. I could not walk. My mind was... Uh, barely functioning, and I was taken to the hospital and I was fed intravenously for two weeks, which I was lucky uh, because those of us who ate, who had access to too much food, died, hundreds of them died because they overate, their bodies could not absorb the food. As soon as he could walk, Murray joined Europe's massive refugee population. He managed to stay alive for the months it took him to walk back to what had been his Hungarian home. This is the same path that I took home 15, roughly 15 months later, where an orchestrated gang of people were lining up the street, taunting us. Here I'm walking home on a dark evening by myself with nothing in my hands. And what is cascading through my mind is what am I going to do next if no one is home? What am I going to do if somebody is home? And when I knocked, finally got to our home, I knocked on a door, and a stranger opened the door, a hostile stranger, and he shouts at me, he said, I thought you were all dead. 
I didn't remember him, but he knew me. And instinctively, I said to him, I'm the ghost. The Holocaust, Murray discovered, had made ghosts of virtually every Jew but himself. And he had no protection from hostile townspeople. Plus, now he had a new enemy, Stalinist communism, that was sweeping into Hungary and elsewhere and often arresting Holocaust survivors. Meanwhile, many Jews had decided to board ships for Israel, despite the inevitability of a war with its Arab neighbors. Murray, however, went to Ireland when a Jewish benefactor offered to transport him and other Jewish orphans for schooling in an old castle there. Less than a year later, the Irish government expelled them all for being Jewish. Some of us would have stayed in Ireland. There were two or three families that wanted to adopt me in Ireland, Jewish families. Uh, I was a good looking kid and uh, I was a charismatic kid, more so than I was now. I was full of spirit. And they were, uh, I had uh, two or three offers to be, to be adopted by wealthy families. And they wouldn't let me stay. Five decades later, Murray would return to Ireland with his best friend from his castle stay. The government extended them an apology for having forced the Jewish orphans to find another home in another country. That home for Murray turned out to be the United States, which welcomed him in 1949. Now, by almost any measure, he has achieved enormous success by any measure but his own. I'm happy with my children's success. I'm happy with uh, my wife, with my acquisitions in life, but I'm not happy with myself. There's a big difference. Uh, because material things don't mean, I'm not a ostentatious guy. I'm not a uh, grandstander. I'm not a guy that has to do something to impress people. That's against my nature, against my personality. So these things mean less to me than the ordinary person. This is why I said I never, never made it to the finish line because of the personal void in my life. Not family void, but my void as a result of losing my parents young, of not having the love of my parents, not having the embrace, not having the security of my parents, not knowing how my life would have ended had this monster not intervened in our lives. This is why I have a void and this is why I will always feel to the very end that I never made it to the finish line. My circle is not complete in that respect. A few years ago, Murray Lynn returned with family members to Auschwitz, where he read a deeply personal letter composed to his mother. Here's a small excerpt. Mom, this vile and dehumanizing kingdom of genocide is now a historical bulwark against future barbarians. We are united in our resolve to never let that happen again. Your martyrdom was not in vain. We have solemnly pledged to never let the world forget our suffering, nor the abysmal fall of humanity. That legacy continues to provide us lessons and warnings. One came in the spring of 2010 when the sign at the Auschwitz gate was stolen by Polish neo-Nazis. And the day after their visit to the extermination camp, the spirit of the Lynn family was terribly wounded back in his native Hungary. As we are walking the streets in Budapest, a car pulls over next to us and a young man jumps out of the car. He must have been in the early 20s and raises his arm and he says, Heil Hitler, and jumps back in the car. And my daughter was with me at that time. And I said to my daughter many times when she was young, don't forget who you are because if you do, uh, someday someone is going to remind you. 
remind you, in the end, that's what Holocaust survivors like Murray Lynn say they feel compelled to do. To remind you that hatred, even in its most vicious and diabolical forms, takes no holiday. We must, they say, keep watch both on the world and on ourselves. We must fight for a better world than the world of my childhood. We must never give up. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Before I go to my prepared statement, uh, <clears throat> let me share a couple of little lingering episodes. One relates to the film. Uh, <clears throat> when there are many, many episodes <laughs> that I had in my life, but one that never would never go away is when my mom was raped. I still have a real difficult time with that. I have, uh, I get very, very emotional. My mom, by the way, was uh, uh, crowned as a Hungarian beauty queen when she was 19 and a half. She was a stunning woman, not only outside, but the inside, inside as well. She was loved by everybody, knew everybody. Uh, she was a incredible and incomparable woman. And when she, when she was raped, after she was raped, I was the oldest of four, I was 12 at a time. And she told me this many, many times. She said, it would have been easier for me to die than submit myself to this monster. But she said, I thought of four of my children. Their dad is dead now. I didn't want to leave them. It, but it said, she, she said, it would have been easier to die. She says, I betrayed your dad. I betrayed my faith. I betrayed you kids. And I betrayed my values. She says, I have a difficult time living with this. Again, I was 12 at a time. Two years later, at the age of 36, this beautiful, wonderful woman was murdered with my three younger brothers after being crowned as a Hungarian beauty queen. Uh, the second little episode that I want to tell you about is that I often tell audiences that my children were also victims of the Holocaust. A poignant moment in my life that I'll never forget when my oldest daughter, who went to Auschwitz with me at my wife's suggestion, I had to go back to Auschwitz uh, to foreclosure. But when my daughter was two on a, either a second or third grade, I don't remember which, she came over one time to me and she said, Dad, why is it that we, that we don't have grandparents? 
and aunts and uncles and cousins, like all my friends. What are you going to tell a third grader? I never shared with my family, my children, the depth of my experience because I didn't want to wound them. But they saw much of my life, or more of my life, not much, because <laughs> there are certain parts of my life that people still don't know and never will. I was a homeless kid after I was liberated for three years, meandering over Europe by myself. I walked and dwelled in places where angels fear to tread. People don't know about that. I don't talk about that. But I didn't want to wound my wife, my children's uh, soul by telling them the true story. But they finally saw this film and they got a little more out of my background than they knew before. So I wanted to share that with you before I get into my uh, formal, before I get into my prepared statement. And so here's the rest of my story. When I was liberated from the nightmares of Auschwitz, there was a tide of optimism that a bloodiest war in history of civilization would tame the savageness of man for many generations. Not even the most cynical pessimist would have anticipated that all that has happened since. The world has gone topsy-turvy. To many concerned, to many, in many corners of the world. And, and anti-Zionism became a popular code for, for, for popular code and camouflage for irrational anti-Semitism. The hateful tropes of Jewish power and influence that have insidious and pernicious history that has a that has an insidious and pernicious history are heard again and looming high in many corners of the world, including in many corners of our own country. And this saddens me the most. America was created to be, in Emma Lazarus's iconic words, a home, and I quote, to huddle masses yearning to breathe free, end quote, regardless of race, religion, and ethnicity. This ideal shaped our country and is part of America's exceptionalism. But these ideals are stained and threatened by purveyors of racism and prejudice and professional agitators bent on disrupting and subverting our social and political order. We must, we must fight back against these rogues to safeguard America's crowning achievement. Auschwitz reflected the irredeemable, immoral, and corrupt European heritage of systemic hatred embedded in its DNA in flowing through his bloodstream. A social pathology that never healed. Its roots can be traced to the church's history. Instead of embracing Jews as their spiritual brothers, many religious leaders masquerading in the garb of piety embraced false prophets in a pernicious theology to demonize and delegitimize our faith. They conjured and yearned for a world without Jews and almost succeeded. It was a vast network of enablers that conspired against us. Europe was its myth factory for predators preying on Jews. For many generations, these predators masterminded fictional narratives to distort our faith. It led to inciting words and mocking language 
to stigmatize and demonize their heritage. The consequences stoked the fires of hatred, violence, and defamation. As the underclass, we had no access to due process or the rule of law. It was a fertile ground for Hitler's agenda. A noted Presbyterian minister and author, Dr. Franklin Littell, sums up our blighted history as follows. And I quote, and this comes from Presbyterian minister. The Holocaust was the consummation of centuries of false teaching and practice. Until churches come clean on this very situation, very little they say about the plight of other victims, helpless persons or groups will carry authority." End quote. It was a commendable statement on contrition, morality, and rectitude. Auschwitz left lingering indelible scars on my life. The ghost of the past relentlessly invades my life and dreams. I still have nightmares on the average of every two or three weeks screaming in my sleep and waking up in a cold sweat. When the moon is high and the clouds clear, I can still see the silhouettes of limping and grotesque skeletons in the shredded and dehumanizing striped suits on the cusp of succumbing to the cruel and inevitable destiny. I can still see the harrowing sight of the raging inferno spilling over the towering chimneys, a constant reminder that each hour and each day may well be our last. And burned in my memories are the gripping nightly wailings and shrill echoes of the sick and dying pleading for mercy and divine intervention to the unheated heavens. These are grisly flashbacks that are seared in my soul. As we face the shadows of death, we solemnly pledge to one another that survivors would never let the world forget our plight as a safeguard and cautionary warnings to a world plagued by ethnic hatred and religious hatred. In summing up my life, my life's improbable journey, I have fought the good fight with passion and resolve against all forces arrayed against me, never succumbing to despair or surrender. And that has made all the difference in my redemptive and restorative narrative. It's a testament to the unlimited power of the human spirit. I rose from the debris and ashes like the mythological phoenix to tell the world our improbable narrative as my life's epitaph to future generations. In spite of a spate of impediments and personal deficits, I am today an expression of Americans' exceptionalism, rooted not in privileges of few, but a concept of meritocracy and equal opportunity, the hallmark deeply rooted in the American dream. And that is my story, folks. I would like to add it, add a little, again, personal story about this. Uh, I took, when I took my daughter to Auschwitz at my wife's recommendation a number of years ago, it was a very, very uh, painful moment for my daughter 
and myself, my daughter in particular, because it was her first sight of Auschwitz and she really got into the depth. I went with a group of educators, 35 to 40 of us. And on the plane back to Atlanta, she said to me, she was very quiet and pensive for hours. And finally, after hours of silence, she said to me, Dad, how would your generation like to be remembered? And I said to her, honey, that is a very profound question. Could I answer you that question when I get home? I'm going to give it to you in writing for posterity. And I did. And here's what I said to her. And I want to share it with you because, in essence, it belongs to all of us. The message belongs to all of us. Remember us not with lavish or brave words. Mourn us not with sorrowful tears, but rather with positive and engaging deeds. Strive for social justice. Work ceaselessly to safeguard our revered precepts of religious, of religious pluralism and diversity. And diversity. And not least, pay any price to protect the ideals of our nation so we would never belong to a racist ideology that stripped our people of all hope and humanity over the centuries. May this message be enshrined in your hearts and ennobled in your memories as well. Thank you very much. We'll do some Q and A. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. If we could bring the house lights up just a little bit, we have two microphones that are on either side. If you have a question for Murray um, and a question, please. Uh, if you want to see him afterwards to make statements, that would be a, a lovely time. But for the moment, if you have a question, um, please raise your hand, and we'll bring a microphone to you. And the uh, sounds a little bit odd up here, so I'll repeat it to Murray if uh, if need be. We're going to start on the side over there. I have a, excuse me, a hearing problem, so uh, Robert Press is going to interpret me the questions. When I said I have a hearing problem, my wife would probably tell you it's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 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 so here's my helper. Very good. All right, uh, please, right there. Murray Lynn, first off, thank you so much today for telling us your story and sharing. And I hope all the generations will always remember what happened. My question to you is, what did you do when you first got off um, into the United States? The first couple of days, where did you go? What did you do? And where did you come through? What was the first thing you did when you came to the United States? So those first few experiences, where did you go? What did you do? Uh, well, uh, my... Uh, presence to the United States, I would have to go back a little bit uh, to, uh, uh, to the a little further back to the past. I, I lived in Ireland for a year, and uh, uh, I lived, excuse me, I have a little allergy. I lived with 120 other survivors, and I want to give you, this is of in, should be of interest to some, if not all of you. Uh, a gentleman by the name of the, uh, Dr. Rabbi Solomon from Great Britain, the chief rabbi, came, uh, heard, or the English, Jewish community in England heard there were 120 kids like myself living in orphanages, uh, living on the streets who had survived the Holocaust. And he decided, as Rabbi Schoenfeld, that he's going to come and rescue us. So he came to the Czech Republic and worked in, in, that, in Czech, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania for six months to collect us. Some of them were children who uh, 
uh, lived with Christian families, and he had to he wanted to retrieve those children as well. Uh, their parents, before when they were taken to Auschwitz, dumped them in the laps of Christian families, and they said, "Take care of them." And these children didn't even remember their parents. Anyway. He took roughly 100, collected roughly 120 of us to, and took us to Great Britain, and they couldn't accommodate that many. So the uh, Jewish philanthropist by the name of Mr. Levy bought us a castle in Ireland where they can house us. So we lived there uh, roughly for a year, and finally the Irish government found out we were Jewish. In those days, the Irish government was very anti-Semitic. They decided that they didn't want too many Jewish kids there. Uh, they didn't want any, in fact, uh, any Jewish kids. So the community, the Irish community and the English community had a job now to relocate 120 kids. So they found homes in six or seven different countries. Three of us got scholarships to the United States. I was one of those three. The rest of them were relocated to different parts of the world, uh, from Australia, New Zealand, uh, Central and South America, Israel, etc. So to answer my question, it's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> uh, but to answer your question, I came here as a student. And my first uh, thing that I wanted to do is find, I heard that we had an aunt of, I found out that my mom had a sister who came here in the 20s. And I, the first thing I did is I went to the Hyas. And I couldn't remember her last name, but I told them approximately when she uh, came to this country. Believe it or not, they found them. And it took them six months to find them. And I lived on school campus at that point. And we were reunited. I never met my aunt before. She didn't know who I was. She didn't even remember my mom because my mom was a child when she left. So that was my first step in the United States. Learning the language was a, was a, a big challenge for me. Uh, going to school and being able to support myself and I had to decide what my future is going to be, what I'm going to do, where I want to live, what I want to do uh, for the rest of my life. So I don't know, I don't want to go into too many details, but I landed in Atlanta after finishing school. I landed in Atlanta in 1956. And the rest is legend. If you want to know more about this, I'll be glad to share it with you. The rest is legend. I don't know whether I answered your question, but it's too, too long. Very thank well. you. On this side, we have another question. I, too, want to thank you for sharing your story. Um, we can't hear enough of it. Um, I was going to ask you that I have a bunch of grandchildren that wanted to come, and they could not come. And what would you have me go back and tell them? But now you've already told me that. I want to give them the letter you gave to your daughter. Do you have it written anywhere that I could get a copy? Do you have the letter that you wrote to your daughter anywhere that uh, we could post a copy of that? No, but I'll tell you what. Uh, I can give you, I can give Rabbi Press a copy of this, and he can share it with you because it's a universal answer. I really wanted you to hear because it was directed to my daughter, but it applies to all of us to do more than we can do or to do more than we're doing to save the world for democracy. In, with, since Murray gave us permission, in, a, in about uh, a week or two, the, a video of this uh, program will be posted and we will, uh, try to, uh, we will put a copy of that uh, piece on our website with the, uh, with the video. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another question I see on this side? Yes. Um, what role uh, has forgiveness played in your journey, and what's your sense of the role it's played in other survivors that you are familiar with? 
What role did forgiveness play in your journey, and is, has it played a role in other survivors' journey? Forgiveness. A huge role. That's a very good question. I have often said forgiving is healing. Hatred is a disease of the mind in a pathology of the heart. I cannot hate. My wife will tell you that I get angry. I'm no saint. But I don't nurture hatred. And it, it took me a little while to get over the past, but I have never been one to dwell on failures. I have never been one to dwell on, on, on the past, particularly if I couldn't learn anything from it. Uh, the past is prologue. We can learn a lot from the past. But forgiveness is, and I urge all of you, those of you who have a tendency uh, to nurture hatred, I said, dispel it from your heart. It will give you a new lease on life. How do you feel about the rise in white nationalism that you see going on in our country right now? How do you feel about the rise of white nationalism that is taking such a, uh, a place in our society these days? I'm uh, deeply concerned, and, and uh, I'm glad you brought this up, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Nationalism is the cause for our demise in Germany. The German, former German president made a very important statement roughly six or seven years ago, and I copied it because I knew that at some point in life I'm going to deal with it. And here's what he said, and this is something that's worth remembering. His name is Johannes Rau, president, the former president of Germany. Here's what he said about nationalism. Patriotism can flourish only when racism and nationalism are given no quarter. A patriot is one who loves his homeland. A nationalist is one who scorns and rejects the homeland of others. That I answer your question. This is a serious problem that many people in our own country confuse nationalism with patriotism. And you should know the definition and the difference between the two so you can talk logic to these people. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. My question is, how did the anti-Semitism that existed in the United States impact you when you came here? How did the anti-Semitism that existed in the United States at the time of your arrival impact you? Well, we, we had, you know, I compared anti-Semitism at that time against what we had in Europe. And, and this was a minor problem in this country, at least in my mind, because I compared uh, apples and bananas. Uh, really, anti-Semitism in Europe has never died. They have, uh, Europeans uh, have never changed. Uh, they still live in the dark ages in the past. Uh, so today, anti-Semitism continues to grow in our country. I blame, in many, re many ways, anti-Semitism for lack of attention by our leaders. Let me give you an example, be more specific. In Germany, anti-Semitism is outlawed, and so is the denial of the Holocaust. Did it eliminate anti-Semitism now? now? No but it's under control. You cannot deny the Holocaust and you cannot make inciting remarks in Germany against Jews, Muslims, anyone else because they get imprisoned. 
We don't have those laws. We need to tighten up on those laws in our country. Uh, we have, we, our leaders talk a good game, but they don't act on it. The other thing is, at some point in life, we're going to have to tweak our First Amendment. Freedom of speech should have limits. And it doesn't in our country. You can say anything about Jews. You can say anything about Muslims, about blacks. We need to tweak our, uh, uh, our First Amendment. Germany did it, and it didn't hurt their freedom of speech. We can do more speaking to our politicians, talking to our politicians. But worst of all, and most of all, our religious leaders are asleep. They are not acting on it. Remember this, our religious leaders are the soul in the conscience of the community. It has to start with them. And I hear nothing. Oh. All I hear is a lot of useless platitudes. That's all we hear is platitudes. We do nothing about it, and until the religious, religious leaders get their heads together and speak up and write their, our political leaders and our government leaders, nothing positive is going to happen. And that's our problem. It's a self-inflicted problem. All right, uh, over there around. Huh. Um, because of everything that happened to you um, in the Holocaust, do you still believe in God? Because of everything that happened to you in the Holocaust, do you still believe in God? <laughs> Young man right there. Uh, that is a great question that I often have and I try to be as evasive as I can. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just tell you this. It has shaken the pillars of my faith. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. Uh, the only thing that I remember about this, I'll never forget. When I was in Auschwitz carrying those 50-pound cement bags to the mixing plant at the age of 15, a SS guard comes over to me and says to me in German, where is your God? And I was tempted to ask him, where was yours for allowing this? But I didn't, because I would have been killed. And my answer is still the same. I don't want to give him any credit I don't know where our God was at a time. Asleep, asleep at wheels. Thank you. Time for a couple more questions. Do we, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna swing over here. For, then we'll come back over. Uh, Mr. Lin, uh thank you very much for your sharing your story. Uh, one question I had is, do you see a lot of similarities that are going on right now in our current political and social climate right now? And what do you suggest the younger generation, such as myself, do something about to combat it? What was do you see similarities in our current political climate to what you saw as, as a, in the Holocaust? And do you have any suggestions for, for younger people today? Well, I don't want to get into politics because it's a no-win deal. <laughs> uh, but the, the biggest similarity is tolerating intolerance. That's the bane of all evil folks, tolerating intolerance. Very good. I think we have one on this side. Are there any records or do you have any knowledge of the fates of the young people with whom you were with in Ireland before you were all dispersed. Oh, yeah. What do you know of the people um, that you spent time with in Ireland? Are there records? Do you, 
have reunions with them? What, what do you know of those folks? Uh, uh, I went back to Ireland uh, on a half a dozen occasions. In fact, the film that you saw has now become an official documentary in Ireland. I worked with a Jewish community there, helping them establish a uh, uh, Holocaust education. They didn't have much of a Holocaust education. I, I went back there uh, for a reunion, but I, most of the people are either dead or have died over the years, or they have discarded, dissipated in different parts of the world that I, I don't know where they are. But three of us, uh, the two other guys that uh, I was, uh, uh, that were Holocaust survivors, were those that came with me on scholarships to the United States. But one of them was, uh, they were both super achievers. One of them was, uh, was a Harvard PhD, a physicist, and the other was an MIT physicist. Uh, I was the bum of the three. <laughs> uh, but don't feel bad for me, I did okay. Uh, but he went back, they went back with me to Ireland. They apologized back and forth. It's a different type of a government there right now. They're more tolerant, but most of the Jews have left Ireland. When I lived there, we had roughly 3,500 Jews. Last time I was there several years ago, they're down to roughly 2,500 Jews in Ireland. But they have a very active education program, and they use this film, my film, for educational purposes. Excellent. Is there any other questions? That, oh, I see one more, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Okay. Thank you for allowing us to be here today to hear your story. I just have one simple question. What do you think when you hear people complain about their lives? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. What do you think when you hear people complain about their lives? <laughs> well... You know, life is what you make it. Uh, uh, I, I don't like to talk to people about negatives. Uh, I, I'll tell you a little story about that. A number of years ago, one of the survivors, uh, that uh, childhood survivors, my wife and I went to Montreal. Uh, we traveled a lot, and Montreal was on our uh, schedule. Uh, met a friend, a uh, childhood friend, and for seven or eight hours, uh, am I correct, all he wanted to talk is about misery in the past. Needless to tell you, I've never seen him again. <laughs> I don't want to talk. The reason that I made it this far in life, because I always focused on the present and the future. You can learn something from the past. The past is prologue, but I've never dwelled much on the past, particularly failures, only to the extent that you can learn something from it. But the, the, and I even tell my son, who is here in, uh, in the audience, I tell him all the time, don't associate with people who are negative and talk about uh, the past, talk about failures. Associate people that you can learn something with and people you can look up to and not down at. You learn nothing from those people. My friends, can we thank Murray for sharing his story with us? Lori's going to wrap up. We're going to take a step back, Murray. Yeah, okay.